Good evening, everyone. I am Christina McGowan, Dean of the Library and University Librarian. Thank you for attending the Alumni Author Panel, A Writer's Journey to Page and Stage. This event is brought to you by the Office of Alumni Relations, the Domena Nicilius Library, and the Office of Community and Lifetime Education. This alumni panel is one in a year long series of events that the university is hosting in celebration of the 50th anniversary of women at Fairfield University. Today, October 20th, is the National Day on Writing. And what a fitting day to recognize the accomplishments of our alumni writers. This day is built on the premise that writing is critical to literacy but needs greater attention and celebration. I am pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening, Carol Ann Davis, professor of English at Fairfield University and director of the MFA program. Carol Ann is a poet, essayist, and author of the poetry collections, Psalm and Atlas Hour, both from Tupelo Press. Her newest work, the Nail in the Tree, published by Tupelo this year, is a collection of essays in which Carol Ann narrates her experience of raising two sons in Sandy Hook, Connecticut on the day of and during the aftermath of the shooting there. Carol Ann is the former longtime editor of the literary journal Crazy Horse and founding director of Poetry in Communities, an initiative that brings writing workshops to communities hit by sudden or systemic violence. Carol Ann. Thank you, Christina, and welcome everyone. This is so exciting to see so many familiar names and faces in the, in the audience and to be here with these <laughs> distinguished alumni to celebrate their work on this important day of the year. And any kind time we get together, I'm just so excited nowadays because uh, one, writing can be solitary work and community is the key um, to keeping us going. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go through our four writers um, in, um, alphabetical order, Elena Dillon going first, Meredith Kayser going next, Lone Lee going after that, and Melissa Tantaquidgen Zobel going last. Um, but throughout this, we're going to also leave a little time at the end for your questions. And I'm totally happy for you to put them in the chat, either to me privately or uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be watching the chat also while I'm moderating. So feel free to put your questions in either ahead of time or um, when I ask for them. So um, thank you so much for all of you being here and for, um, I have wonderful proud mama feelings even though I don't really have claim, you know, ownership of any of your uh, wonderfully distinguished careers, but, it, but it, I get to be that person tonight as the director of the program. So without further ado, I will introduce Elena Dillon, who is the author of Mercy House, which is in development as a CBS all access television series and the forthcoming okay. The Happiest Girl in the World, which will be forthcoming from HarperCollins in April, 2021. Her work has appeared in publications, including Lit Hub, River Teeth, Slice Magazine, The Rumpus, and Bustle. And as so many of us do, she teaches creative writing and she lives on the beautiful North Shore of Boston. Oh. Elena, Thank welcome. You. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, and it feels particularly uh, relevant and special to be uh, celebrating women at Fairfield University um, because my debut novel, Mercy House, is about um, fierce and enthusiastic women who band together. Um, and it was launched by a group of fierce and enthusiastic women. So my, my two agents are female, my, um, my film agents are female, my editor, copy editors, publicists, 
marketing professional. Um, they're, they're all female. And then Amy Schumer, um, who is producing it and the screenwriter. So it's, it's just a, a lot of uh, collaboration by awesome women. So, um, so like, I guess I'll start where my writing journey began um, at Fairfield U. I graduated the MFA program in uh, 2011 as a nonfiction writer, actually. Um, and I wrote um, a memoir through the, uh, through the program and I revised it and I tried to submit oh, it. Really? So and so um, I was told repeatedly, which maybe a lot of writers here have, have heard that with nonfiction, you need a very strong platform, um, either as a celebrity or you, very need, you need um, a big following or you need a very um, significant story, a uh, personal story. Um, so I was like, hmm, how do I build a platform? Maybe I'll just write some novels. That will be easy. Um, so I, I switched to fiction. And uh, luckily for my third semester project where you get to kind of um, explore outside of your concentration, um, I studied screenwriting with Bill Patrick. So I kind of had a foundation of how story structure might work. Um, so I, I developed that and I, I wrote a bunch of different novels and it turned out it wasn't as easy as I thought it might be. Um, so I, I, I wrote a novel and I got a representation, which is a, like a, a huge feat in itself. Um, she submitted it all around, it didn't get much traction. So I wrote another book, she submitted it all around, didn't get much traction, wrote a third book. Um, and at that point I switched agents and I wrote another book. So now I have four novels stacked. Um, as in addition to my nonfiction work, um, and the fourth novel was Mercy House. So it's my debut, but it's certainly not my first book. Um, and at the time I was represented um, by a male agent who read Mercy House after reading my other books and um, found the main character so unlikable uh, that he said, if you're gonna um, write books like this, we can't work together. Um, so I was just so, attached to uh, to Sister Evelyn, who is the main character, that I said, I guess we can't work together. Um, so that's when we parted ways. And um, I, I kept working at it. I kept doing different versions where I, I fleshed out um, different aspects of the book. Um, I got to know my characters much better. And, uh, and then I, I got this representation um, about two years ago in 2018. And I, I had kept extending these deadlines where I, I thought to myself, okay, now I'm in my late 20s. Um, I don't have, I have all this part-time works pieced together. My opportunity to have a career is kind of slipping through my fingers. Um, if you look at you know, my resume, like what were you doing these last 10 years? It's becoming, um, so I kept making this deadline. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give up after this. Um, if I don't have it by the end of this year, if I don't have it by the end of next year, and we kept extending the deadline. And I swear this is the last time we were gonna extend it. Um, and then, yeah, then I, I got uh, I got another agent in, in May, and by August we had a publication deal and film interest. Um, so it was just this like absurd uh, thrill of a lifetime, especially after ten years of it seeming like it was never going to happen. So um, I was incredibly grateful for that. And then um, the book came out uh, in February, right before uh, a global pandemic. <laughs> So um, that has been interesting. Um, you know, I, I've been wanting to see my book on a, on a bookstore and then all bookstores are, are shuttered down. But um, it's, it's been an un, unexpected gift that people have um, done these creative con um, connective events like what we're doing right now, where I get to, um, to join readers in their living rooms, you know, uh, virtually, um, where they have their book clubs and, and maybe there's like more of a personal connection in that way. So that's been a, a real gift. Um, so the book Mercy House, um, I, I, I forget, I didn't actually see what time I started here, but um, very quickly, it was um, inspired by, um, since this is a Jesuit college, it was inspired by uh, my time at St. Joseph's College um, in Long Island, um, where I met these awesome nuns. Um, and the book is about um, Sister Evelyn, who runs a women's shelter in Brooklyn. And um, is investigated by the Vatican for breaking church doctrine at her women's shelter. Um, and she is breaking church, church doctrine. So when the bishop comes to visit, um, she has something to hide. And uh, all the, the residents of the house um, kind of band together and share their voice and, um, and work together to keep the, the, the shelter open. And it's kind of a, a Me Too movement um, novel. So um, yeah, again, I didn't see what time I started. So I, I think that's probably about my time. Um, so thank you again so much for having me. And if you anyone has any questions, I'm happy to address them at the end.
Thank you, Elena. That was wonderful. And um, I didn't keep up with your time either, but I promise I'll do better with the other three. Um, but it was wonderful. It was probably a little short, but, we, but we'll get you some questions at the end. Um, and I look forward to seeing your book on a shelf one fine day. Me too. In an actual bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when I browse a shelf. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Um, now we turn to Dr. Meredith Kayser who is a 2001 PhD graduate of New York University's Steinhardt School and a 2015 graduate of Fairfield University's MFA program. In between those two things, she became the Dean and still is the Dean of Fairfield University's top ranked Egan School of Nursing and Health Studies. That's what she does by day and um, in the margins or by night, I don't know. She sneaks her creative writing into the margins of her busy life, um, including dedicating lots of time during residencies um, to, to her writing during the MFA. And prior to pursuing fiction, she published 11 professional nursing books and earned four American Journal of Nursing Book of the Year awards. So her journey um, to page is various and um, I'm looking forward to hearing more, Meredith. Oh, thanks, Carolyn. Hi, everybody. It's so great that you were able to join us tonight. Um, I love nothing more than talking about um, my novel and my journey there. So, and um, Elena and I did not plan our comments, but my journey actually was shockingly similar to hers. So I'll share a little bit about, um, especially when it comes to the agents and all of that. And um, yes, please time me because I'm going to try to stay within my time. Um, I tend to be a little on the terser side. So um, I could always I could always add some stuff in the margins, as you say. So, so as you as you had said, um, I'm a nurse and I had um, I've been in academia for many, many years as part of the academic role. Many of you know, you write a lot. And I had written a lot of professional nursing books and I actually was getting, I found pretty good at it. You know, I had won a couple of awards. It was, it was looking really good. On a personal note, I love fiction. I devour novels. I like a week could go by, I could read two or three novels a week. I've, constantly, I was a Nancy Drew fan when I was really little, always had a book in my hand. And even now I'm reading this Kate Morton book from the library and, um, just, just love reading. And so, you know, here I was. So I, I, I write well professionally. I love to read novels. I should be able to write a novel, right? It's just, and, and I also had a story. I lived in this house in New Haven. Um, it was a Queen Anne Victorian uh, early. Um, it was very unusual architecture for that area. Uh, most of the houses were built about 20 or 30 years later. So when I moved into the house, I did some research about the bones of the house and um, found myself a good story. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to write a book. I'm, I, I have a story. I know how to write. I like to read novels. It should all come together really nicely like that, right? Well, like Elena, <laughs> it's not quite as easy as it looks. So I, you know, I sat down and I wrote about the house and just wrote, 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 and I thought, okay, I really nailed this. This is just a dynamo story that's probably going to be on the New York Times bestseller list by the end of the week, no doubt about that. Gave it to a few friends, and, you know, people are very kind, but, um, yeah, it was very clear that their thinly veiled <laughs> comments were, were uh, showed that the book probably wasn't very good, so I tabled it, to be honest with you. This is probably 2010, 2011, didn't, um, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I can't write. I'm going to go back to reading books and writing professional novels. And then it occurred to me, well, Meredith, you know, you've had situations in your life before where you really didn't know what you were doing and somehow you figured it out. What did you do? Well, you'd think because I was an educator that it might occur to me to go get some education. But after a couple of years, that's exactly what happened. And I remember that Fairfield had an MFA program and I made a few phone calls and did some research. And I applied and I was very fortunate to be admitted to the program, which is, um, so this is back in, I think, 2012, 2013. So was just um, took my story into this program. And I was so very blessed to work with amazing faculty like Carol Ann, who taught me how to be a poet. 
<laughs> but I did learn a few things about poetry. And I see Karen Osborne is on the call. Karen and I wrote an article about the experience of older adults through dementia. And we looked at some novels and it was just really, an, an, and some of that ended up in my novel. So through the course of the program, oh, and also met amazing friends too, who I'm not sure if they're on the call now, but um, wonderful, wonderful women I got to work with who really helped to inspire me and drag me through this. At the beginning of the program, I was not the dean. And then through the program, I became the dean. So there was a little bit of a transition there. And then um, finished the novel shortly after the program and did the same thing, um, tried to get an agent. I remember one of the workshops I went through with the MSA said, you know, you think you send it to one or two agents and you get one, but no, you have to send one that I ended up signing with. And we, um, she sent it out to a lot, a lot of people. And um, eventually I got a small press that uh, ended up publishing the novel. It came out in 2019. I got an amazing editor through that program who really shaped it up um, and made it look a lot better. Um, and here is my novel, The Keeping House, which I'm so very, very proud of. Um, it is a fraction of the novel that I wrote. It's, you know, it's only like 250 pages there, but I think I wrote like thousands of pages before. It. And it's about a fearless nurse, a, a fearless young woman who is kind of down on her luck. The novel opens as she's sitting on the front steps of this house and the, waiting for the party real estate agent to come and show it to her. She's really down on her luck. Her husband recently died, left her with a ton of debt. And she talks her mother into buying this house with her. And over the course of the moving in, they start to discover all of the house's secrets. And the house weaves back and forth between this contemporary story and the original owners and builders of the house who planted some of these secrets. And there's a lot of little intermingling and twists and turns of the plot. And um, there's a little surprise ending at the end. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. it um, it's not going to win any great Pulitzer Prizes or anything, but um, I'm proud of it. And um, it's an easy read. It's a fun, easy read. It's got some good reviews. And um, that's pretty much my story. How'd I do? You did great. You did <laughs> five minutes. Oh, okay. I told you I was first. <laughs> Yeah, but it was, it's exciting and I'm getting all kinds of good ideas for questions. I hope that people in the people are people out there are thinking of questions for all of our writers. That was wonderful, Meredith. And I didn't, I, I didn't remember that you actually became, now I do. I remember the dean, you becoming a dean like during it, but. Yeah, yeah, so I started the program in 2013, I think, and I became the dean in 2014. So, and, and I think you and I had worked together. Right, that right I, I couldn't, time. yeah, it was, it was a lot becoming the dean. So we worked yeah. on some different, you were very flexible, I recall. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing, life requires flexibility. If we didn't know that before this year, we certainly do now, right? Yes, yes indeed. Yeah. Thank you, Meredith. You're welcome, thanks. Now Lone. Lone Lee holds an MFA degree in fiction from Fairfield, a Pushcart Prize nominated writer. Her short stories have appeared in Craft Literary, Mud Season Review, and Angel City Review. Lone is an editor at, this is terrible, Lone, is it Atria Books? Yes. Okay, Atria, uh, Atria, Atria Books, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster, and she lives in Manhattan. A Faux Love Story is her first novel, and you can visit her website. I'll put them in the chat for you, put it in the <laughs> chat for you, but it's visit her website at writerlonely.me and find her on Twitter at Lone Lone. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, so yeah, so A Faux Love Story is my debut YA rom-com. It's about two Vietnamese American teenagers um, whose parents own rival pho restaurants. Um, and they end up falling in love and also figuring out their, their life path because you know they're expected to follow a, cer a certain path, but they're also exploring creative paths and they want to figure out how to, how to do that. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a, a heartwarming story about family, um, about love, about dedication. Um, and it's actually my, you know, my first YA kind of work. Um, so from the very beginning, I guess, what made me a writer? I 
think I'm definitely an introvert. Um, I definitely have an overactive imagination. And I just remembered my childhood always just being inside my head, making up stories. Um, but I didn't really think that it could amount to anything until maybe college. College is when I was be began to be really serious about writing. Um, I love the English department at Fairfield. I took a bunch of the regular English courses, but also fiction, nonfiction, poetry, which is mind boggling, Caroline, like poetry <laughs> is just on another level. Um, and, but my major was journalism. And I think that was my first career path that I wanted to do um, initially. I was part of the mirror for my whole four years from being a writer to editor in chief. And I was pretty serious about journalism considering it as a career path until um, I got my first, first internship at Simon & Schuster where I'm currently um, working. Um, and I got a really close look at how books work and how writing works and how I just wanted to be one of those authors, you know, who, who, whose books are like taken care of by these people um, who are crazy passionate about, about writing. Um, so I guess uh, I was really serious, but then after, after college, um, I graduated in 2014, uh, and a week later I went right to work at Simon & Schuster as an editorial assistant. Um, and I think I decided to go into the MFA program because I, was feeling stuck. Um, I think I was like two years in as an editorial assistant and I felt as if I was like losing my passion in writing itself in the act of writing. And I, I never wanted to do that. I, I always wanted to keep this. Like I wanted a career obviously, but I also wanted a passion. Because those two are, sometimes they're mixed together, but sometimes they need to be separate. Um, you, can't, you can't be defined by a career. Like I, I love the idea of being defined by your passion um, as a person. So um, I went to the MFA program. I applied, and I it was like the only it was the only MFA program I applied to because I I heard such great things about it. Most of the professors I've already learned from at, as an undergraduate, um, and it was really a life changing experience for me because um, I don't I think I I always like structure when I'm being taught, and MFA really taught me structure. It taught me to really love fall in love with the craft of writing, um, not just learning how to write, but why I'm writing. Um, uh, I just learned so many things from the different mentors and the one-on-one -on -one aspect of uh, this program where a writer and an educator, writer and educator in one, they get paired up with the writer. They teach you along the way. They see your work as it's developing. I always love this aspect the, of writing where you're, you're constantly improving yourself and to see that you know, improvement over time. I just, I just really enjoyed it. Um, and in the program, I was mostly doing, I was only doing short stories, really. Um, and it was more of adult, bleak, traumatic stories, I think, uh, which I still write. And then towards the end, I got more interested in the supernatural, like ghostly kind of stories, um, especially with Vietnamese folklore, uh, which I really enjoy. And I'm still very, um, I'm, I, I still write that. But, um, but after I graduated in 2017, I was, I, I didn't think I had a clear publishing plan. Like I, I think I wanted to just keep on writing, keep on improving and writing and then gradually placing my short stories. And that's what I did. I took my time to place short stories. So I was on the web, on um, in print as well. Um, and then I think in 2018, so this is where like this journey, I think is a little interesting. It's unusual, but it actually happens more often. And I'm, I'm really excited to share it because it's, it's something that I think writers could consider doing. Um, so I got an email out of the blue from an editor who's my current editor. And she said, hey, I know you write. Um, I've seen your work online. Um, uh, I have an idea. And she, this is the idea that is now the book. Um, she was like, would you be interested in auditioning for this story that has Vietnamese American teenagers, a, um, a restaurant kind of rivalry, something heartwarming about family? And I was like, okay, tell me more. Like, this is amazing. Um, so she sent me a very brief outline and asked for some pages. And um, for me, I was, I think I've done one of these before. It's, it's essentially an intellectual project, um, property project meaning the idea is formed in-house um, and it's just an idea and then people hire writers to write it. 
And sometimes IP is where the writer is very kind of silent. The writer is just writing it. It's not their identity. It's not their um, kind of career on the line. Um, this one's a little different because, because um, it, I have the copyright. I was able to negotiate for a copyright for my book and it's essentially my book. And um, the outline, I was able to kind of break it apart so that it was longer than they intended. <laughs> and then I submitted the first 10 to 15, I think it was 15 pages um, of what I envisioned for this novel. And during this process, I think I was trying not to get my hopes up because I auditioned before for IP um, and, um, oh, IP also, there's Nancy Drew, um, Babysitter's Club, Gossip Girls, that's IP. Um, a lot of the comics in, for Marvel, for example, are also IP. Um, but yeah, but when I was auditioning, I didn't want to get my hopes up because I had auditioned before and not for this one, but for another think tank and it didn't work out. And I, I was like, oh, no, no, I tried so hard and then nothing happened. So I just tried to put my heart into it. I tried to be very honest as well. This was like my first time writing um, about someone from my background, my age, um, into the story. I used Vietnamese, my Vietnamese language, um, this experience with my mom as well. Um, and then a week later after I submitted materials, um, the outline and the uh, first 15 pages, um, I heard, you know, they loved it and they wanted to offer on it, um, which was the best news ever because I was, um, I was in a spinning class and I almost fell off my bike. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, from there, um, it's a little backwards, but I was able to interview with three agents and I picked one of them who's, who's amazing. Um, has, he's just, he's, he, it's a guy too, but he's been just com like extraordinary. Um, he swept, he came in and he like negotiated a better offer and, and things like that. Um, so I really love my agent. Um, but yeah, it, and that, so it took like about two, like a year and a half to write the full novel. And um, my editor was actually really hands off with it. She was just like, write, because she would trusted the outline that I wrote. And she just said, just write it. Just write the whole entire thing because it doesn't make sense for me to come in when you're writing something fresh um, at all. So I had a lot of fun. I was torturing myself because I'm not good at deadlines. And I was also working full time. I'm still working for a full time as an editor, which is, means my brain is gonna explode one day um, because of the words and everything. But, um, but yeah, and then it got, you know, it was such a great journey. Um, I learned the art of editing as well from, you know, my editor and we have ARCs. So now ARCs is, um, it's being sent out. It's already sent out to indies and media and bookstagram and it's starting to crop up on, you know, like websites. Um, and, and it was in Buzzfeed recently. And, um, so the marketing and publicity my plan is um, just, start, oh, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, it's just st starting to begin. Like I'm chatting with them next week um, about pre-orders and, and things like that. So, um, so yeah, so I think one of the questions that we had was, um, are, are there things you wish you had known or had done differently? And for me, I wish I was better with deadlines, giving myself more time to write um, because I think I was stressed out a lot of times. <laughs> um, and um, I guess another question was, do you have advice for anyone who's thinking of starting a journey? I have so many, I'm, uh, so many things that I would say to, to any writer. Um, be excited about it, be passionate always, um, be committed to learning all the time, all the time. Like you, you can't, you're, there's, nothing, there's nothing that, there's no perfect writer. Um, so, so I think you should just remember that because it's constant improvement. Um, it's dedicating yourself to a craft and, and understanding what you're writing. Um, I encourage writers to submit and feel and always and celebrate the rejections. Celebrate the, you know, the wins, but rejections are amazing too. <laughs> um, it kind of hardens you to the rejection that you'll have all throughout your life. Um, and, and I think surround yourself too with writers and just good people, good people who start celebrate you, who lend you a list, an ear whenever you're you're kind of crazed. Um, kind people, I think that, that makes that that really I love. Um, 
And then the last one about, sorry, I'm actually going through this, <laughs> but the 50th, 50th year of women at Fairfield, being woman, um, I'm really proud to be a woman. I'm proud to, to come from a family of very strong women, very, very strong. Um, my mom is definitely my like um, idol and she's this four foot nine Asian woman who <laughs> looks nice, but then when she can on her bad side, you're done, you're done um, forever. So, um, but yeah, I, I think um, I, I think this whole journey, it, I've, I've never been held back as a woman. Um, I don't think it's right for people to do that. I, I know it happens and I really hate that it happens, but um, I think it's, I don't know. It, for me, it's been such a empower, empowering journey. And I think I went over overboard, so sorry. Well, I was mesmerized, so you know, <laughs> the timekeeper was happy. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Lone. And I actually, thinking about your mother, I remember one of your very first poems for my class was was a beautiful poem about her, I think. Yeah, many years ago now, maybe seven years ago now. <laughs> so um, last, but certainly not least, we have Melissa Tantaquidgen Zobel. And she is the medicine woman of the Mohegan tribe of Uncas in Uncasville, Connecticut. Tantaquidgen Zobel's first book publication was a biography of her me mentor, medicine woman Gladys Tantaquidgen, titled Medicine Trail, with, and it was published by University of Arizona Press in the year 2000. After receiving her MFA from Fairfield in 2012, she moved into fiction, writing the young adult murder mystery Wabanaki Blues, published by Poison Pencil Press in 2015, which I think I, that's where I became aware of you, Melissa. Um, at the request of director Steve Nash, she began writing screenplays in 2017 and her screenplay Flying Bird's Diary about the woman who saved the Mohegan language has won dozen of, dozens of awards, but uh, has been slow to receive funding. In 2020, she entered the full-length stage play version of Flying Bird's Diary in Eugene O'Neill Theater's National Playwrights Conference. And together, she and Tara Moses, who is a sim from the Seminole um, Indigenous people, um, became the first two Native American playwrights to advance to the finals in the same year, I think, which is kind of exciting. So Moses and Tanaquid and Zobel's plays will both advance to the finalist round, which is exciting because it's happening now, um, of the National Playwrights Conference in 2012. Um, Zobel's collaborative stage project, Up and Down the River, with her daughter, stage director and playwright, Madeline Sayet, 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 uh, was commissioned by Hartford's Heartbeat Ensemble. This is a five-part radio drama, and it will be broadcast in its entirety soon during the week of November 20th, and it chronicles the struggles of Mohegan leaders from the 17th century through the 20th along the river we call home. So one of the things I'd just like to say reading all that is to say that one of the marks of a writer and what, something we encourage is the variety, and many people have spoken about moving genre um, and you are, you are a great example of that as are, I think everybody here, but like really like moving among three genres just in that bio. So welcome, Melissa, and tell us about your journey. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, this is really thrilling to me to be at this celebration of, of women here with you today uh, for, for many reasons, but uh, the series you just talked about, Up and Down the River, is about Connecticut at a time when Connecticut was a matriarchy because the indigenous people of Connecticut, um, you know, the women here, we all really kind of ran the show. And so uh, what's really interesting about, about that piece, I think from um, an outside perspective is that it looks at how those women lost their power in the colonial era how that power disappeared and how they spent the next four centuries trying to get it back because it, it happens over time. So it's, uh, it's kind of apropos to everything that you're doing here. But I did wanna do a real shout out to the NFA program and thank them because one of the things that uh, 
I've noticed some other folks talk about is turning, I guess Meredith mentioned it, you know, take your, take your weaknesses and turn them into your strengths, right? The places where you really are failing. And when I entered the program, uh, I had a real hard time with seeing. I don't know what it was about seeing, you know? And I, I'll give you an example. So I wrote, I wrote these two books, which like, I don't really want anybody to look at or look for anywhere, except they have great covers, gorgeous covers, right? But the scenes are terrible. They're just terrible. This one just got a shout out in the New York Times this week because it's like a founding mother of Native American sci-fi. And I was thinking, oh God, please don't, please don't read that. But in any case, <laughs> the rest of them, after my MFA program, I started to learn a little bit about scene with these two, especially this one. And so much so that, as I told you, uh, a Hollywood director said, you know, I read your book and I think you can write screenplays. And I'm thinking, oh dear God, it's all scene, right? <laughs> That's my first thought is this is my ultimate nightmare. There's nothing else but scene. It's just scene after scene after scene after scene. He said, oh no, it's there, you can, you can do it. But uh, I did have some, some great professors who helped me with scene. And I guess that would be, uh, you know, um, it would be Da and, and Da Chen and Karen Osborne and Eugenia Kim. Uh, shout out to Da on the other side, you know, always saying, give it your whole. And so you, you, you give it your whole, right? You go back, you get educated, as Meredith said. You, you learn a little bit more about what you need to do. And, uh, and then you learn to overcome your biggest obstacle in this case, which is scene. And uh, scene is now to the point where after I finished writing the screenplays, um, I started to move into stage plays. And I thought, well, I might as well try it. I mean, how different can that be? And my daughter is a playwright and it's sort of irritating for her because I think people think she got it from me, but actually I got it from her, which is sort of a reverse, you know, thing. But uh, Flying Bird's Diary did exceptionally well. And again, I credit my greatest weakness, which is scene, because there's, you know, there's not a lot of description in place, really. It's all just dialogue and scene. So um, I kind of don't understand now why I didn't understand it but I found it, you know, super challenging. So um, I know we're getting close on time. So uh, I guess we, no, we're not, we're okay. Okay. Uh, other things that you wanted to talk about, um, you know, things that you would do differently. I would have liked to learn scene first before I wrote the other two novels. I'll be completely honest about that. So that would, I would say if you do have a major weakness, that's a really good reason to go into an MFA program, even if it's just one. And, and I think for a long time, what I felt was, I'll just work through this. And no, <laughs> that was not the answer. So I guess that's all I've got. I, I really am admiring of the other, uh, the other writers because I've never had an agent. Um, I've never had any kind of representation. Um, Me either. I still, <laughs> what's the, I still don't. I haven't either. Place. Yeah, I just don't know what that is. I'm just so excited for you. I'm thinking it must be a beautiful thing. Um, and and yet I just kind of, you know, I'm just kind of a plotter, but, uh, but it is a little different with stage, right? Because you're looking for workshops, you're looking, so you're, the fun thing that I think you all would enjoy if you haven't done stage plays is other people help you make them better on a regular basis. You know, you, you workshop plays and so, the places in your stories where maybe they're a little rough, you're working through them as a team. And I, I think that's a very different process than most of us. I know Lone talked about having friends and uh, Meredith talked about having people who read her, her, her works and all, but it's very different to actually have people speaking the words and saying, can I say it this way? Can mm -hmm. I try this? Um, and, and I'm finding that a lot of fun for anyone who enjoys that process. Uh, you know, working with actors, uh, who are engaged in it. And, uh, and I think for me, that's a, a different kind of writing that really works. Thank you. That was wonderful. All of you were so wonderful. I'm, I'm applauding for everyone here because it was really inspiring and the themes and the threads were clear, you know, um, celebrating rejection, uh, leaning into weaknesses, 
uh, taking your time, seeking out community. I mean, it was amazing how much it all went together, given how much, how little, how lightly we planned it all. It sort of all fall, fall together because writing is about those, um, those very essential sort of exercises that are almost spiritual in nature. Um, so yeah, Meredith. So I didn't, I didn't answer any questions uh, in my, um, in my couple minutes, but I will share one other thing if we have a minute, um, that I did learn from the whole process. And that was to check your ego at the door. Um, one thing that I felt was very helpful was to just be vulnerable, to be, um, open to the feedback from your friends, to learning new things which is hard for all of us, I think, but um, it was a decision I had made consciously in becoming a student when I was an academic administrator to just, just this was probably gonna be my last experience, educational experience, and I wanted to, it to be an educational experience. So I really felt I had to, to just um, really just be open to all of the feedback that people were so generous and kind to share with me. Making that sort of along with the celebrating rejection, right? <laughs> it kind of goes with that. Um, we are starting to get a few questions in the chat. Diane asks, um, she has a personal essay about 2,000 words or so on a positive spin on Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's journey with her mom. And she's wondering about any tips. I think she may be any tips in getting published maybe. Um, it sounds like it's done, 2,000 words or so. Um, any thoughts about placing it? Um, I, I mean, I know about Poets and Writers. There's like a really good on poet, poetsandwriters.org. You can uh, search out different magazines with different specific uh, interests and find one. Um, Meredith, did you have your hand up? Yeah, so um, we would be happy. We have a journal that one of my colleagues, who's also a nurse enrolled in the um, MFA program, uh, Dr. Susan Bartos, is the editor-in-chief of a journal that Fairfield publishes through our library here um, with Dr. McGowan and all of our wonderful staff up there. Um, it's called SANA, which is self-actualization through um, self-actualization through nursing arts, but it, it, we do focus on different um, diseases and those kinds of experiences. So feel free to reach out to me or my colleague, uh, Susan, and we'd be happy to take a look at that for you or advise you in any other way, but good for you. Good job writing that. That I'm, I'm sure that was a very helpful process given the challenges um, coming from a gerontological nurse practitioner perspective. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I can understand that that must've been a really difficult experience for you and I'm hoping that it was somewhat healing to write that so happy to work with you on that if that's helpful. Great thank you um, and now we have another question for the group it sounds like everyone came in wanting to be a writer or, pro or with prior writing experience uh, what do you think you found most helpful for you by joining the, a formal MFA program and what did you learn about yourself you didn't expect? And Elena. Yeah, I'll, ju I'll jump in. Um, so what I found to be super valuable, and I, I think I've, I've heard this a lot um, talking to other MFA alums, um, is the community that you create that you continue to lean on after graduation. So I, for one, am a terrible self-editor, um, like developmentally speaking. So if I'm looking at a novel, I, I know that it's weak, but I can't quite identify why. Um, and I really benefit from readers. Um, so I still kind of tap on my friends from my MFA program, like you want to swap um, or can I owe you a favor? Um, and then their, their feedback is just incredibly valuable. Um, and, and as soon as somebody points something out, I, like I zoom in and I'm like, of course that was it. How did I not see that all along? Um, and just kind of discussing character motivation or um, how the plot should go. Um, just like that kind of con conversation helps me understand my story better. Um, but then in addition to that, that mentor relationship that you have um, with your faculty mentor um, where they kind of go back and forth on your work, 
in a, in a really practical way mirrors your relationship with your agent and then your editor. Um, so that kind of sets um, kind of an example of how you'll operate later when you're when you're you know moving forward in the publication process. So it's nice to have that foundation um, and to know how to work with somebody's feedback and how to have those conversations uh, when you're really applying it in the in the public in the publishing process. I absolutely agree with that. That's that was such a great way of explaining it, especially the community aspect. I think. I think people, I think what Caroline said, was saying that writing is solitary and that's very true. And then people forget that we need people. We need other people. We need that warmth. We need that community. Um, I, for me, I, I'm still very close with my MFA um, cohort and, and we have our own separate, you know, writing group um, that we, you know, it's been on pause because of the pandemic, but um, that has helped so much. Um, I really appreciate the mentorship aspect as well. Like you mentioned, it's very, it's, it is very true. Like it's someone who is um, focusing very, like zooming so closely into your work and viewing it as, as, as yours. And versus like when you're in like in a, in a classroom or something, um, or I mean, like a, a general workshop where it's like one person um, trying to look at multiple people's work for the mentorship. It's like this one mentor that's maybe doing at most three students at a time and, and they really look at your journey and they um, I love the aspect of writing craft essays, especially. Um, I know that's a little odd to say, but the craft part um, it's just identifying pieces like sometimes themes that you use in your writing or techniques that you use in your writing and and thinking about it more. Um, that really helped a lot. Um, because it's like the foundation for your writing. It's, it's stuff, stuff that lessons that you learn from this mentor um, and these essays and applying it to your life, life work of, of, um, of, of, of things. It, it doesn't apply to one specific novel or something. It's all of your writing um, for a lifetime, so. Yeah, Melissa or Meredith, I don't know if you wanted to answer that or comment um go ahead Melissa if you want to go first I feel like I've been talking a lot <laughs> yeah I, I would definitely concur with Elena and Lone um, the experience of community within the MFA program was a really unanticipated and um, really ex uh, wonderful benefit the first day of the program so here I am kind of this older woman walking into um, a new um, master's program, thinking there'll be a lot of young people, and um, and there was a there was a really great age range. So um, I met two of the best friends of my life in the program. We continue to get together all of the time, and um, we've got a Zoom schedule session scheduled for next week, and celebrate each other and support each other and help um, each other writing, moving along our, our writing. So I think that's really one of the really great benefits of the program, the community of writers. And also just as you said, staying in touch with our mentors, that has been just such a wonderful experience. I, um, outside of the MFA program, I have not been able to find that same type of community of writers. So I'm so grateful to continue to have that community. I know one of the next questions that came through is how to find that. And I can't give any great advice on that, unfortunately, but very grateful for my continued involvement with the MFA program. Melissa? Or Melissa, did you wanna chime in? So yeah, my story is a little different than that because um, in terms of community, it was really interesting. When I was growing up there, weren't a lot of Native American writers. Um, the Native American writing renaissance kind of took place as I was growing up. And so uh, I, I knew a few people and uh, they were iconic to me. You know, they weren't really my community. They were just these luminaries. And some of you may have heard of Joseph Bruchak who's written several hundred books um, about the Native Northeast. And he's a personal friend and was, was really a mentor. Um, so there was no community um, in, in terms of finding other native writers except the one or two here and there. And uh, in 1992, when I went to the first ever native writers conference in the country, um, I just I had no idea there were all these other people and that was kind of wonderful. But um, 
but because our subject matter is is so hard to write about and so different, uh, I was just really grateful for the diversity of professors at Fairfield who could at least kind of zero in on some of that. And I found that particularly with Eugenia and Da, um, two professors who really had a very international experience and you know, really had such a great worldliness about them that they could really embrace something that was so different than, than what they had actually experienced. And, and that, that is, in that sense, that was a community connection that I did find. Thank you, Melissa. Elena, did you have something to add? I think you, I saw you. You know, I was, I was just moving on to the next question. Yeah. I was related about go ahead. <laughs> Please go. Sorry. Um, so the next question is asking about uh, social media and how and what that uh, that plays um, or how that factors into finding community as writers. Um, and so I don't know um, how many of you are part of the, the binders full of women group on Facebook. Um, so it's it's kind of a playoff of Mitt Romney's binders full of women, um, but it's just a, a huge community of thousands of female writers. Um, and you can ask, um, and they, then they have subdividers for all different genres. So like there was one that was forth, like forthcoming 2020. So there we were able to discuss a lot of the problems we were facing as being debuts during the pandemic and different ideas for promotion and um, how, cause like a lot of bookstore events, even virtually have preferred author and conversation. So um, it's been a good way to kind of team up and find people that want to have a conversation. Um, so that's been really helpful. But the, the, the general binders full of women is, has been a place where I ask like these really obscure random questions, but the community is so huge that somebody is relevant. Um, like for instance, um, with the book that's forthcoming in April, which I have an arc, um, is <laughs> yeah, um, is about a, a gymnast who's training for the Olympics and all of the losses um, that that uh, that that people have to um, to sacrifice in order to achieve greatness. And I, I'm not a gymnast; I've never practiced gymna gymnastics, but that was going to be a huge aspect. And um, so I, I needed an expert who was a writer and a gymnast to um, be my um, to be a reader. Um, so I, I asked and I, you know, offer, I was going to offer payment and I actually ended up landing the, um, the ghostwriter for Allie Raisman's memoir. So it was a huge win for me that I had this like extremely qualified writer and gymnast to be my authenticity reader. And she was absolutely invaluable. So, um, so there are communities like that and that, that give you access to a lot of different kinds of people. And then as far as um, like connecting with readers and things, Instagram has been um, very valuable because that's, you don't have to be uh, connected to people. You don't have to be friends with them. Um, they can just tag you when they've read your book and offer a review. Um, and in that way you connect with readers and you see your, your book in the hands of people even when you're inside. Um, so, so that's been really fun and, and connecting with hashtags and, and things like that um, to different writing groups to try to get your, yourself flagged onto other people's feeds, even if you're not connected with them as a, as a strategy that I'm still learning. But um, the, those two resources have been, have been particularly helpful for me. And earlier on, um, sorry, earlier on um, in people's writing, I'm not sure whether Paul's question had to do with um, promotion of books or the seeking of affinity groups, which you covered both of those, Elena, but the third major community of writers is the one that we were talking about happens at the MFA program. And I think that, I mean, as a director of an MFA, I've seen people, you, a few of you talked about sort of topping out in terms of what you could learn inside community writing groups. Um, right. So like, you know, and I think uh, when we, we can even get to the point where we have figured out a craft issue at that level like that so community writing groups are a really amazing kind of step for people I think like the Westport writers group or I mean there's you know um so just to say not only on social media but in the world there are there are workshops that are not MFA programs in my mind that can be a step when you when you really get to the end of the utility of those but you still have craft things you're trying to learn or as Melissa was saying, I can't do scene, and you're just very aware of something like that. I think that can often be the step at which an MFA program is the next step. I don't know if any of you can speak to that kind of 
seeking of community. Lone, you had it as an undergrad. You had a community of undergrad, you know, writers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was, I was, I think I didn't realize it until like senior year um, where- The capstone. <laughs> yeah, the capstone was really fun. It was great to be exposed. And there was like this, um, this writer, Lee, who I'm, I still talk to from time to time, who created this whole like, a different kind of magazine it was like it folded up into eight pieces and it was like ton of art yes why did I just forget the name I feel so bad Wagner Wagner, Wagner is the name of the magazine yeah. I can't remember the name of the student though yeah, Lee, community yeah. it's just so good because it, it's just it you have you remember you remember why you write when you're in a community they share their passion with you and you can celebrate them um I think on uh, a, a tool, another tool that writers can well, um, I go back and forth sometimes because there's Twitter. I feel like I, sometimes I'm in a vacuum where there's, I feel like book publishing is all on Twitter. And I, I just follow a bunch of, I have all my friends and stuff. We follow like, you know, agents and other editors and, and things. It, it could be a good tool because it's a way to kind of celebrate sm small celebrations. Like, um, you know, this author tweets, they finished their draft. Great. Like, that's amazing. Congrats. Um, they placed it at this magazine. Great, awesome. At the same time, it, it does kind of open up this thing where you're like, oh, what? Like you're kind of measuring yourself against this person on Twitter. That's that's unhealthy. Um, so I think there's a point to social media where you probably should step away. Um, and that's why the in-person things. Um, like I had an undergrad and also my MFA program and. There's Westport writing. I've heard great things. There's mm -hmm. in New York, if you're based there, there's Gotham's Writers Group, um, 92nd Y um, as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know what else I was going to say. Yeah. Does anybody have any closing? We're just about out of time. We want to respect the Zoomness of things. It might have gone over, but on Zoom, people are, you know, it's very incredible to you know, have one hour of someone's Zoom time. So we're very grateful. Um, Karen's saying congratulations. And Karen's one of our wonderful faculty. Um, if you are interested in learning more about this wonderful community of writers and find out uh, more, you could email me at cdavis at fairfield.edu as I'm the, I'm the director of the MFA program. Uh, I couldn't be more grateful for the community that has sustained each other and myself over this, this long year. Um, and I just, I loved hearing from all of you. Congratulations and thank you so much. And thank you to the, Christina and everybody behind the scenes who hosted Alumni Affairs and uh, have a wonderful evening, everyone. And definitely email me if you wanna know more about the MFA. Thanks, everyone.